Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, although it's a little bit disconcerting when somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I, I think you'd be a really good person to talk about failure. Um, as an environmental studies professor, I'm used to it. Don't get me wrong, we have a lot of successes where our air and water is cleaner and we've protected habitats, but certainly we need to look no further than the melting glaciers and all the challenges of energy consumption and waste and social justice and greenhouse gas pollution and carbon dioxide soaring towards 400 parts per million to realize that we have a long way to go. One of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is endangered species and our coexistence with those. And there are some notable examples that many of us know about. <clears throat> the dodo is certainly a terrific example of our failure to coexist with the natural world. And there are thousands and thousands of others. I'm interested in cats and large cats. And of the 37 species of cats, and certainly the eight largest, virtually all of them are threatened at some level with endangerment. The largest of the world's cats is the tiger, Panthera tigris. It's found in Asia, and it has a close relationship with humans. It took all of human history for us to go from being ourselves an endangered species to reaching our first billion people in 1800. A century later, we had 1.6 billion of us on Earth, but it was really in the 20th century when we went from 1.6 billion people to 6.1 billion people that we really had an impact on this planet and the species that coexist. In that same century, we went from an estimated 100,000 wild tigers to maybe only 5,000 wild tigers. And over that same period of time, much of the habitat where tigers and other species that share its home survive, disappeared. And it's not really surprising when we think about where people live. Today, we have seven billion people on Earth, and about half of those, over three billion, live in the countries where tigers are or used to live. And this map of uh, the parts of Asia where tigers live with the brighter colors showing higher human impact, this was done by Eric Sanders and his colleagues at the Wildlife Conservation Society, gives us an indication in places like India and China with a billion people each of the scale of human impact. And all of these people need land. We need land for food. We need land for cultivation and for houses and for energy and transportation. And it's that challenge of trying to coexist with people and wildlife that is one of the most significant challenges that we face. We have struggled to live with large and dangerous beasts throughout our history. The science writer David Quammen in his book Monsters of God has a great quote in the beginning where he says, one of the earliest forms of human self-awareness is the awareness of being meat. And every time that we have confronted the danger of living with large and dangerous beats that can harm us or harm our property or harm our families, we have done a pretty good job of trying to eradicate those threats. We have done it formally through things like eradication campaigns or as retaliation for conflict. Although increasingly, uh, at least in some instances, we are able to take those animals that we call so-called problem animals and we're able to bring them into captivity. Today, probably the biggest challenge in addition to loss and fragmentation and degradation of habitat is the harvesting of those animals for profit. Whether it's tigers or tiger prey, we take these animals out of the wild both so we can try and share in the glory of the king of the hundred beasts through amulets or for traditional Asian medicines. And it is this need for wild tigers and tiger products that is driving them towards extinction today. If you look at everything we've done over the last decades and all the efforts that have gone into trying to conserve these species, it's hard to imagine any other word than failure. 
We only have about 3,000 wild tigers left in the world today. But it would be misleading if I left you with the impression that all is lost. So we actually have a lot of tigers in captivity. And if the story of wild tiger decline is one of failure, you'd think the easy answer then would be the increase in captive tigers should be a success. But it's actually not that simple and it's not that easy. And I hope I can convey in the, in the next few minutes why that's the case. A lot of the tigers that we have are in managed breeding facilities. The zoos many of you may have visited as, as children or as adults. A thousand that are under accredited systems in Europe, North America, Asia, Australia, maybe 500 more that are, are formally uh, zoos but maybe not accredited. But many more are found in people's backyards or roadside zoos that have minimal care for these animals or in circuses and other facilities. There are even more in tiger farms, in the growing number of places in East and Southeast Asia where tigers are being grown with the express future expectation that they can meet the ever-growing and insatiable demand for tiger parts and tiger products. That we can get enough supply to meet the demand or if we eliminate tigers from the wild. This is a problem. Uh, my colleague Ron Tilson and I a few years ago realized that nobody had actually taken the time to count how many tigers are left on the world. We've done it numerous times to try and estimate the wild population and we're not exactly sure how many. When we did the assessment there are about 4,000, now it's probably closer to 3,000. But we decided to figure out how many tigers were also in captivity. And what we recognized is there were more tigers in captivity, many of them in private ownership, here in North America than there were in the wild. And there might be two, three, four, or more times as many tigers globally in captivity than in the wild. And this is a problem in part because many of these tigers are not of some kind of a known origin. Over the 20th century, we lost three tiger subspecies to extinction depending if you're a lump or a splitter of the five or six subspecies that remain, many in captivity are mutts. We don't know where they came from. So they would serve no useful purpose being put back in the wild. Many of the tigers in captivity are white tigers. That there are no white tiger populations left in the wild. It's also a problem for humans. We have documented hundreds and hundreds of cases of individuals, including children, being killed and injured by improperly kept tigers. And it's not good for the tigers in the wild. Oh, sorry, tigers in captivity. Some of you may have uh, remembered the incident a couple of years ago in Zanesville, Ohio, where a private breeder of large animals couldn't take care of his animals anymore. He took his own life and then release these animals, including many tigers, out into the rural landscape of Ohio where authorities had to put them down. So having a lot of captive tigers isn't necessarily a good thing. Fortunately, there's a lot of attention that's been given to the challenge and the failure of our protection of wild tigers. The prime ministers of several of the tiger range states, leaders of the tiger range states under the auspices of the World Bank and many large conservation organizations convened in St. Petersburg, Russia a little over two years ago and signed the St. Petersburg Declaration with the intent to double the population of world's wild tigers by the next year of the tiger in 2022. Whether we can actually do this or not, and whether the half a billion dollars that was dedicated to this effort will actually make an impact on the ground or in the communities where people struggle to coexist with their needs and those of wildlife is certainly yet to uh, hold true. But what's clear is we had a significant statement and potentially the most significant single meeting over a single species ever held 
because it put the public officials on record as stating that they would meet this target and can be held accountable. I think there's a lot of reason that we can hope that even though there's trillions of dollars of development and dams and roads and infrastructure development across Asia that's gobbling up in the same habitat that tigers and all the other species that share its home live, we can look here in the United States to realize that we can make a difference. It was only four decades ago that we passed the Endangered Species Act here in the United States. And we took species that we thought were a problem and we had official eradication campaigns and we eliminated for most of the lower 48 of the United States. And we said through the Endangered Species Act that we will protect these and keep them from going endangered no matter what the cost. And indeed, we have now delisted the gray wolf for much of parts of the United States. Here in Waterville in Maine, we can look outside and we can see the symbol of our country, the bald eagle that was once endangered soaring overhead. We are in a state that was covered with farms and sheep a hundred and some years ago and today is 90% covered in forest. So we can change. And there are people all over Asia who are working hard to make this change. And part of it is a level of awareness. If we understand what the challenge is, well, I'm not sure ecotourism is always a good thing for tigers. It certainly is one kind of an example of ways that people are trying to coexist with different species. Education is absolutely something that's critically important. And if we understand what a real tiger is, and if we understand what real tiger habitat is, and we understand the threats that real tigers in the wild face, it's easier for us to recognize why a white tiger or a tiger that is living in substandard care is not something that we want in the future. There are people around the world who are dedicating their lives to both protecting tigers and working with local communities where tigers and many other species live. And we are now recognizing that there are opportunities to restore these species to places where they may have disappeared or to encourage the growth of those populations where they still hang on. A decade ago, my colleagues and I did a survey, Ron Tilson, Jeff Montefering, and others in China to look for the last of the South China tigers. And we published a paper that recognized that it was extinct in the wild and none have been found since. It was a clear example of our failure to coexist with tigers in this part of the world. But in the intervening decade, the last remnant captive population has grown. The government of China declared at the St. Petersburg Conference that it would try and restore tigers back to the wild. And indeed, plans are underway, and Colby students have helped to do mapping to try and identify where this could happen, where we will actually be able to put these tigers back where they live for thousands and thousands of years. So I think if we recognize what we have done to tigers, but this could also be for other species or the earth in general, we take the time to inform ourselves about those challenges, about our failures, and think about what we can actually do to solve those problems I actually think we have a lot of hope. Thank you very much.